Desmond Tutu, Johannesburg and the West Bank. I am because we are. The end of the world was coming, apparently. There were messiahs everywhere. A young man from Colorado was arrested for provoking bloodshed after saying he'd be killed on the streets of the city, then rise again on the third day. The bloodshed would have been his own, but they deported him anyway. A student was found wandering the desert half-naked, calling himself John the Baptist, although it wasn't clear who was meant to be his Christ. There were plenty of candidates. Messiah fever, they called it. Every few days, someone else would declare themselves the second coming, out there on the streets of Jerusalem, a city where Christians were only competing to be heard alongside Muslims and Jews. This is a story about Desmond Tutu, the great South African campaigner, but it starts in Jerusalem in 1999. It was chaos, glorious chaos, full of beauty and danger, and this thrilling, clashing city was fully open to visitors for the moment. There was peace of a kind, and tourists could come with a freedom that would soon be gone. So I was there to do a piece on pilgrimage for a national newspaper with a bunch of people from the church in Wales, pilgrims of a kind I felt friendly towards, even if I didn't share their faith anymore. I knew their stories and the sacred texts, but I'd lost my faith during a difficult part of my life a couple of years before, and I wasn't really sure where I stood. So I was there as an observer, allegedly detached, but actually wondering how to react to this place where faith mattered, where faith had been a matter of life and death for so long. Was it all just bonkers? Or was there something beyond all the tourism and strife that I could still connect with, even in my unbelief? The streets were rammed with people around the gleaming golden dome of the rock, the third holy place of Islam after Mecca and Medina. I found myself almost standing cheek to cheek for a moment with a young woman in a black hijab, her features sharpened by fasting during Ramadan and her eyes alive with awe at this place. An elderly lady in white, perhaps her grandmother, was making rapid movements with her hands as she mumbled prayers, eyes half closed. The official hour of prayer was approaching and soon... All non-believers would be asked to leave, but for the moment we shuffled behind each other, single file, shoeless and mild. For once, the tour parties were quiet and respectful, overpowered by the intensity of the atmosphere. The flat white rock behind a wooden balustrade had been sacred for so long, and to so many. It was said to be the place where Abraham brought his son to be sacrificed where the Holy of Holies stood in Solomon's temple, where the curtain was torn in two on the day of crucifixion, and where Muhammad ascended to heaven. Outside, under a cloudless sky, we walked down to the ancient limestone of the Western Wall, the most holy place in Judaism, last remaining fragment of the temple, Men in black hats, long black coats and matching beards rocked and beat time with their feet as they recited the psalms. Younger men in prayer shawls passed scrolls around while their women watched and took photos from outside the enclosure. A teenager with a phylactery tied to his forehead wore Israeli army combat gear, his talith shawl only half covered an automatic rifle. Beyond, over the rooftops of the walled city, was the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, revered as the site of Christ's death, burial and resurrection. Just before dawn, I'd watched a Coptic priest in a black skull cap stand in that echoing church, chanting his liturgy to nobody but God. Now the sun was high, the place would be tight with tourists and their guides, and something did strike me standing there, an epiphany, if you like, a revelation, although perhaps an ordinary one. Something had been going on here 
for a long time in this small space, a corner of just one of the many cities on Earth. The central events, the central stories anyway, of three major religions had all allegedly taken place just here. Abraham, standing over his son, trying to work out why the God who had told him to kill the boy was now saying no. The rip in the temple fabric, the tear in the history of humanity, as Jesus hung on the cross. The beat of the wings of the horse-like beast called Barak, as it bore the prophet up to heaven. Those were some of the tales told of the things that happened here. There were many others. But what were they really? A conversation of sorts in this place. A strange fractured dialogue between humans and the divine. I didn't understand it. I couldn't shake off how maddening, frustrating and heartbreaking some of it had been. And still was. All that hurt. But I was suddenly able to see it as a bunch of broken people trying to make sense of glimpses they'd seen of something more. And I knew, in my bones, I couldn't walk away. Not entirely. Thankfully, none of those I toured the holy sites with believed they were the Son of God. Some of the details may be mythical, said one of the bishops. That doesn't bother me. Nor did they believe the four horsemen of the apocalypse were about to bring morning coffee, although we did visit the plain of Megiddo, which is where the Bible says Armageddon will begin. And this was 1999. We were on the verge of a flip of the calendar that some saw as ushering in the end times. The visitor centre in Megiddo had a webcam trained on the plane, so I wrote a news story saying the end of the world will be televised, just for a bit of fun. There was so much reaction... They took the webcam down. A week later, I wrote another piece. The end of the world will not be televised. That was the headline I'd really wanted because of the Gil Scott Heron song about something else altogether. The revolution will not be televised. These are the games journalists sometimes play with ourselves as a defence mechanism against the huge, terrifying ideas we're dealing with. And it doesn't get much more terrifying than Armageddon, does it? I believed in it once. Now? Not so much. Although the idea of the Y2K bug causing computers to malfunction and planes to drop out of the sky was distinctly worrying. And I was maybe a bit nostalgic from my days of certainty when I'd known what the hell was happening in the world and how to deal with it. So even though I was profoundly disenchanted with religion and religiosity and I'd lost my old faith, I was looking for a way to connect with whatever might be behind and beyond all that. And something did happen in Jerusalem that was completely unexpected and surprising, like being mugged. It was elemental too, rooted in the natural. We were at the Pool of Bethesda, the place in the city where the sick and ailing would come in search of healing in the old times. Once a day... The legend said, an angel would stir the waters, and whoever was in them or touched by them could be blessed. I've heard that the stirring of the waters actually came from the temple altar being cleaned, the blood of the sacrificial lamb being washed away, and the mixture of blood and water going down into the drainage system, eventually reaching the pool, causing ripples, which were taken to be the actions of an angel. I don't know if that's true, but blood and sacrifice, and cleansing. That's a very old idea. One of the oldest. Again, I was struggling, though. These were just ruins. Crowded, faded remains. None of it meant anything. Until I found myself going down some steps to stand beside a pool of dark water. Nobody else was there. Suddenly it was me, and the water and the stones that made the high walls around me, and the blue sky up above. Nothing else. Suddenly, it was elemental. Suddenly, I could feel connected, somehow, like I was there, back then, when things happened. This was all instinctive, not thought out. I was just 
reacting, feeling. And as I did, I became aware of someone coming down to stand behind me, one of the Welsh. I didn't know his name, or I'd forgotten it. He knelt down beside me, wordlessly, and scooped up water from the pool. Then he stood with it, still cupped in his hands, and turned to me. And he looked me in the eyes, still without saying anything. My hands happened to be clasped together. He poured the water over them and enclosed my hands with his. I felt the cold water, then the warmth of his skin. Still he was looking at me, with kindness. Then he smiled. He nodded. He dropped his hands and walked away, back up the steps, leaving me there. And I wept. I still don't know why. The Welsh were on what they called a Living Stones pilgrimage. They'd go to see the Holy Land and all the usual sites, but they'd also visit fellow believers in Jerusalem, the West Bank and Gaza. Life's not been easy for Christians in those places. It's not been easy for anyone. So it was that we took a coach out of the city to a place two hours north, where the Bishop of Jerusalem was to celebrate communion, and we were to meet Palestinians. There were not many of us, from memory only thirty or so, who gathered in a chapel to take the bread and wine that are for some the body and blood of Christ. I was there as an observer, at least that's what I told myself. Then the bishop announced that he had a friend coming to speak, and in walked a man that some considered a living saint, and I certainly saw as a hero. Desmond Tutu. Archbishop of Cape Town, hero of the struggle against apartheid, leader of the attempt to bring truth, reconciliation and therefore healing to his country against all the odds, friend and ally of Nelson Mandela, winner of the Nobel Prize for Peace. Blimey. The congregation received him with a joy that would only have been matched by the actual second coming. Tutu was approaching 70 at this point. He looked more tired and older and smaller than I'd seen him on the telly, but we later learned that he was on a private visit to meet members of the Israeli government and Yasser Arafat, the chairman of the Palestinian Authority. That must have been a bit stressful. The old peacemaker was trying to work his magic here, and when he spoke, it was electrifying, even in weariness. His voice had an intensity that lifted us an authority that came from experience, and a clarity that was thrilling. He drew a clear parallel between the suffering of black people in South Africa under apartheid and that of the Palestinians. I wrote down what he said. I told my people, these others might think that you're nothing, they may trample on your dignity with hobnail boots, but know that God loves you with a love that will not let go. Then he turned to the bishop and said, Our God, your God, the same yesterday, today, forever. If change could come to South Africa, he was saying, it could come anywhere, including here. I could almost believe it in that moment. Being with him felt special. Was that because he was a wonderful human being? I wasn't sure. He was energetic and he had an entertaining way of chuckling, a persuasive way of jabbing the air while he was making a point, frowning for the difficult bits and breaking into a wide, winning smile. But I also had the feeling that this elfin man was really quite human. And I was about to find out how true that was. Afterwards, there was a lunch with extraordinarily good food and stories that warmed and broke the heart as well as some lengthy and stupefying speeches. A 12-year-old girl sang a song about the lives lost during the uprising called the Intifada. 
but I was actually sitting there the whole time, frantically trying to remember what I knew about Tutu and what on earth I could ask him, because somehow I'd managed to persuade his people that it would be okay, even a good idea, if he let me interview him. Sure, they said, after the lunch. We're driving back to Jerusalem. Come with us. Sit in the back and talk to him. This was astonishing. A career-defining moment for a kid who'd not been on the Nationals long. The chance to get a story out of a man who had been at the centre of one of the biggest stories of our time in South Africa and who was now apparently at the centre of another, even bigger story, the Middle East peace process. More than that, on a personal level, I was about to be close up with a man I really admired. I spent half the time trying to think of sensible questions and half the time panicking that I wasn't up to this, not by a long shot. And then the time came. The speeches ended, goodbyes were said, Tutu and his people moved towards the cars. Again, from memory, I think it was a black diplomatic car of the kind you find at embassies, presumably with bulletproof windows. The minders were in suits, with sunglasses hiding anxious eyes. They knew what was happening, though. They knew it was OK for me to be there. They knew it was all right if I opened the door of the car. They watched me get in. I got in. And he screamed. He yelped, maybe. I know it was primal. I know there was panic and fear in it. I know it was a shock to find him yelling at me. Get out! Get out of my car! the Nobel Peace Prize winner shouting in my face. And with good reason. Nobody had told him. He didn't know who I was. He didn't know what I wanted. He only saw this big, blonde stranger get in next to him in this troubled foreign land. He must have thought he was about to die. I would have screamed too. I got out fast. The minders shrugged, and the car left in a hurry without me. Gone. Absolutely gone. I stood there, watching the dust cloud settle again, feeling a bit stupid, wondering what had just happened. With the connection I was longing for, the moment of humanity between us, broken in tiny pieces on the floor. The next time I saw him was in South Africa, 14 years later. The country was mourning the death of Mandela, and I was sent there to report, giddy and confused and still adjusting, having been there before, but still learning, trying to find something to say about this great moment of national and international convulsion and sorrow, but also celebration. So I found myself that Sunday at another Mass, this one to celebrate Mandela's life, in Soweto, at the Catholic Church of Regina Mundi, Queen of the World. A thousand people were there to remember Mandela. Some wore ANC scarves, others their own colours. The sodality of the Immaculate Heart came in their powder blue uniforms, looking like holy nurses. They danced to songs and hymns in English, Zulu and Kosa, and it was strange to be standing among them with other members of the media, wishing I could dance too. Watching the photographers move among them, cool and dispassionate at first, thinking of nothing but getting the shot, even if it meant blocking an aisle, being in the way, focused and intent, but slowly being won over, because the music and the dancing and the smiles and the tears and the warmth were contagious. So by the end... Their body language had changed. They were smiling, cameras down, letting the moment and the emotion touch them. They got the shot, yeah, but they'd also got the point. 
Here, there were still bullet holes in the ceiling. This was the spiritual heart of the biggest black township in the old days, a centre for the struggle against apartheid. The place to which young people fled for sanctuary during the Soweto uprising of 1976, when the police entered and opened fire. A church described by Mandela when he came back as president after 27 years in prison as a battlefield between the forces of democracy and those who did not hesitate to violate a place of religion with tear gas, dogs and guns. And a place where Desmond Tutu came with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to hear those who wanted to be heard. Tutu heard hundreds of testimonies from people who'd been beaten, tortured, imprisoned or bereaved, and from people who'd done those things, who wanted to own up to them and tell the truth in the hope that it might set them free, at least emotionally, or that they'd be given amnesty for doing so. Families were finally able to confront those who had hurt or killed their loved ones. Hidden bodies were discovered and given decent burials. Secret crimes were brought out into the open. The history of apartheid and all its sins was laid bare. Some people saw this as truth without justice. But South Africa did begin to heal a little. Tutu played his part, and at the root of it was a thing he called Ubuntu. Apologies if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Ubuntu. I am because we are. This was his take on a way of living and being he said he'd learned from tribal and traditional beliefs that we're only able to be fully human when we're with other humans. He called it the ancient spirituality of humanity's oneness with our creator, the other and nature. We are all one. If that sounds a bit high-minded, there's no point in me trying to sum it up. Let me quote him explaining. Ubuntu is the essence of being human, and it says a solitary human being is a contradiction in terms. I can't be a human being on my lonesome. I wouldn't know how to speak as a human being. I wouldn't know how to think as a human being. I wouldn't know how to walk as a human being. I have to learn from other human beings how to be human. And so, Ubuntu says, my humanity is bound up in yours. I am only because you are. We then say a person is a person through other persons and that we need this communal harmony if we are going to survive at all. Tutu said forgiveness was a way to healing. Anger and revenge and bitterness are corrosive of this harmony. Forgiving is not being altruistic. You're not being nice to the other guy. You're actually being nice to yourself. Forgiving, apart from anything else, is actually good for your health. And he chuckled when he said that, in his infectious way. And there's something else that Desmond Tutu said that still makes a huge impact on me, coming from the place I did. God is not a Christian. Think about that for a moment. The Archbishop of Cape Town is saying it, but he's doing so as an African brought up to believe in the invisible world, the world of the spirit, even before he was a Christian. All of us belong to God. God reveals God to all of us, and we have different understandings of God, he says in an interview with Christian Egger of the magazine Herald of Europe in 2006. I don't believe I have a God who sits and worries that a Buddhist may come up with a wonderful idea. I do not feel obliged to think it cannot be a good idea just because it's a Buddhist idea. No, I'm thrilled that a Hindu could be such a leading exponent of non-violence and affect and influence so many people as Mahatma Gandhi did. I'm not upset that one of the most brilliant scientists, Einstein, happens to be a Jew. You see, it points to the wonderful bounty of God that none of us has a proprietary claim on God. God 
is God. God is forever free. And that takes me back to the Western Wall, to the Dome of the Rock, to the Pool of Bethesda, and the feeling in my gut that something wild and crazy and real and bigger than all our stories, rules and rituals has been happening. They say rain is a blessing because it brings life. And the day after Regina Mundi, there was a downpour. I felt the rain come down hard on my neck and shoulders as I stood at the back of a marquee, half in and half out, waiting to see if there'd be room at the tribute to Mandela that was being held at his charity foundation's headquarters in Johannesburg. The Soweto Gospel Choir was to sing. All Madiba's old allies were there, his closest companions on the long walk to freedom. And it felt like a family affair, something close and intimate on a humid night under the thundering rain, as Tutu took the microphone and hit that room like lightning. What would have happened had Madiba died in prison? That made them gasp. They knew the truth. Wonderfully, of course, the anti-apartheid movement triumphed and sent that vicious system reeling into the gutters of history. Peering through his spectacles, giggling occasionally at his own jokes, rolling his words with relish, baring his teeth in a smile and jabbing that finger in the air again, He talked about his friend's first night of freedom, spent at Tutu's official residence in Cape Town. He did something I have seen him do many, many times. When he went to a banquet, Madiba would go to the kitchen and thank the staff because Madiba was really saying to people, not many of us are VIPs, but all of us are VSPs. We got there before him, of course. Some of us had heard this before. Very special persons. Then he shouted, Now I want you to stand to pay homage to Madiba and say, I am a VSP. So we did. Now, the cynic in me kicks in. This was monumentally cheesy. But on another level, That night, it was beautiful. These were people who'd lived through the hardest of times together and seen terrible things, but had also seen miracles in their country. They were sad at their loss, but grateful too and willing to share their friend with the world. Finally, I felt a sense of connection with him and with everybody else in the room, which I hadn't earned, but which was being given freely with such generosity and grace. Not like when he chucked me out of his car, but a bit like the way I felt when that stranger scooped the water from the pool of Bethesda, held my hands and looked into my eyes. Finally, I could say with Desmond Tutu and all the rest of us lesser mortals in the room, I am because we are. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. The music you heard was recorded by me at the Church of Regina Mundi in Soweto, 
or on the streets of Johannesburg outside Nelson Mandela's house in December 2013, just after he died. Can We Talk is a collection of true stories about encounters with remarkable people and what they've taught me about how to live, really, how to be a better human being. And I would love to hear yours. They don't have to be famous or infamous. They can just be people who've made an impact on you personally or in your community. You can find me on social media as Cole Morton, C-O-L-E-M-O-R-E-T-O-N, or you can get in touch via the good people at Hodder Faith who brought you this podcast. So find out more, look at other people's stuff, and contact me via hodderfaith.com. In the meantime, just between the two of us, if you could subscribe and like and maybe write a complimentary review, that would really help because it gets this thing noticed and the more it gets noticed, the more stories we get from each other and the more we learn. Thank you. And again, thank you for listening.